The question of evil is of fundamental importance to all of us. Yet, although it should be the core element of any philosophy or religion or spiritual pursuit, it is often just shrugged off as a fact of nature or a law of the universe or a step on the way in evolution, among other insufficient explanations. A lot of contemplation and reasoning is applied towards the internal and external behavior of the self in such systems, but very little in comparison to the question of evil. What is evil and why is it so important to understand it? My contemplation brought me to the conclusion that failure to correctly assess evil in all its pleasing and displeasing forms, in all its simpler and more intricate shapes, is key in the persistent failure to overcome it. In this case, I am not postulating a way to defeat evil in the sense that we could get in a fight with an opponent and come out victorious from the bout. No, I am using the expression overcome evil as a state to be left behind, first within and then without. This is not going to be an easy topic, and despite trying my best, it is quite possible that it will seem confusing because words are completely inadequate to express such an issue. I will do my best anyway. So what is evil? In a grosser manner, we can certainly all recognize it in gratuitous violence and harmful mischief, but that is not enough. It isn't enough because the very environment we are in, in this very universe as we like to call it, has evil ingrained in its very basic structure. And then there's appearance for less evident matters. Depending on the circumstance, feeding someone can be promoting evil, and sometimes a good smacking will do a world of good for someone, right? Everything in the universe requires sustenance or fuel in one way or another which leads to everything being subject to decay and destruction, which then leads to everything being subject to time. So time is key. But am I stating that time is evil? Well, yes and no. Hear me out before getting confused. Time is a curse upon this reality, so a curse upon evil, yes, because it promotes constant change and the inevitable and eventual destruction of everything as well as its reconstruction after that, and so on. Yet it is also a blessing, because it does not allow the evil nature manifested here to endure either. You see, the main concern of actual high-level evil, let's put it like that, is not merely to cause suffering and sustaining its own baser cravings. Its main concern is to convert all into itself, into its likeness so that nothing surrounding it ever reminds evil of what it truly is. Evil hates, it loathes innocence, grace and pure love. It does so because these are traits that reveal to itself the abomination it became. Of course this is not a rationalized process, evil entities do not think about this, they simply trigger to attack the innocent, the gracious and the pure loving, until they cease to be innocent, until they cease to be gracious and until they cease to love purely. Yet underneath their conscious cosmology, a movement is occurring, guided by the time curse and blessing I previously mentioned, that allows this guilt, so to speak, to eventually always come back and re-emerge. Even the most seemingly incorrectable and cold-hearted psychopath will, in time, regurgitate back into their consciousness all the accumulated shadow they have thought they thought they weren't getting repressed. You see, to me, from what I observe, that is the function of time, to expose evil to the good. Such are the machinations of evil that they always end up revealing themselves inevitably, whether as a part of their plan, or as a part of their need to gloat, or as a part of the process in which they want to somehow prove what can never be true, that their evil is as true as truth. It is a transient flame only, 
a mere ephemeral flash that comes and goes amidst the eternal unchanging background of truth in which its stage is set. As I answered one of the comments to one of the previous video contemplations, I asked the author of the comment, who was correctly enumerating and showing many factual aspects of the evil grid that is being both discovered and self-revealed. I asked them, but is this victory? Who is the prison for, truly? I ask these questions because those of us who are in contact, in whichever way it is, with truth that precedes us and is so unimaginably higher than us and all the universe, in such a way that is completely ineffable to the senses, including thought, those of us who are in contact with truth know that we are here, but that we are not from here. We know that we, despite the motions uh, we go through and the interaction with this theater, we do not belong. We know that if we are not turned to evil, we will not be the ones behind the physical, social and psychological cages that we currently see being built. So let us not bite the bait. If we are not evil, then the cages will not be filled by us, but by them. The cage of power, the cage of suspicion, the cage of control, the cage of hate. Evil truly traps only evil by making the other evil, even if that evil is trapped uh, resembling good. Let me try to clarify that statement. We are immersed in a psychological and ethical and moral dichotomy that shows us good and evil as being opposites. For instance, we can consider that violence is evil, for example. Okay? However, if there is at least one circumstance in which violence is actually a proper good and true response, for instance, self-defense, then violence can no longer be just evil, but a tool used by both sides. The good shepherd and the bad shepherd, the good cop and the bad cop, both shepherds, both, both cops, both, therefore, flowing from and to the same source of universal system. Moreover, violence is omnipresent in this reality, from our bloodstream to the steps we take as we walk, which potentially kills countless other beings, as well as even the most basic hygiene that destroys organisms that could otherwise, if left unchecked, cause unbalance and illness in our bodies. So my contemplation is that evil is not a set of behavior, behavioral tools or moral codes per se, as both evil and good in the reality, in the reality, can use any tool as well as justify themselves under any moral or ethical code. My observation brought me to the conclusion that evil is simply illusion, falsehood, anything that is not truth, which is all we can sense here. And that is why I often state that truth speaks no words, because no word can ever be actual truth, but only a tool that can either be used to bury the aggregates that make up the individual deeper into evil, or otherwise point these aggregates of the individual in the opposite direction of where falsehood is, allowing that the attention towards that general direction triggers a timeless recollection of truth, then inexplicable within reality and its tools. That is why it is important to realize that reality is falsehood. Otherwise, contact with truth without that realization can provoke madness and related psychological issues in a confused ego as it tries to find that truth in the reality it dwells in and that it is made of, which is impossible. In fact, the more we dissect reality and find falsehood, the closer we are to truth realization, despite its ineffability to our senses. So it is important to understand, even if just rationally, the process of uncovering. Religions and spiritualisms will often tell us to accept things for what they are, but that is a double-edged sword. It can cut falsehood, but it can also cut us from truth. Mere acceptance of circumstance is not enough, 
Therefore, as it may bring us closer to indifference towards coexistence with grosser or even more refined types of evil. That is why I do not buy the we are all one meme, but favor more the expression we are all parts of one. If we reflect on it, the first expression, that is, we are all one, implies a motion of dissolution or incarceration into a single individual, awfully resembling the same consumption we perceive as feeding in this reality, right? While the second expression, that is, we are all parts of one, implies that we are not dissolved, incarcerated or consumed, but that we are individualized functions of something higher, not food, not energy sources, like the first expression implies, but differentiated expressions of truth. Beyond the veil, something, a source, is continuously calling us, without words, from outside of all illusion. Acceptance of that source will actually make us separate, that is, disconnected from illusionary stimuli, which therefore means disconnected from the temptations of falsehood, or, as I define it, of evil. So if that which resembles good attempts to feed on you, in one way or another, then know it is evil in disguise. In the same manner, if that which resembles evil tries to remo remove you from a position of prey without placing you in another predatory relationship, then it might very well be good merely resembling, resembling evil in its form. We can only know the value of the nature of things by that which they are not. Speaking metaphorically or mythically, there are two shadows, twins if you prefer, that regulate our reality. Both are shadows, as said, and therefore both are false. Yet one seems to be bright and luminous, good, the other seems to be dark and shady, evil. Still, both are false. It's the good cop, bad cop dichotomy mentioned earlier. Appearances are not truth, and we are unable to determine from appearance. Yet one of the tools that has been developed in recent decades, that is, that of analysis, allows an ego to comprehend that which a thing or a subject is not. We can say, this is not true, that is not true. And as we do so more and more, we approach actual truth outside of this realm. And, more importantly, we increase its link to our internal world. Because we make room previously occupied by falsehood in our psyche. If we are able to do that, to diminish falsehood within ourselves, then we can probably change that old expression that goes, all roads lead to Rome, to a more fitting, all roads lead to home.